Hello everybody and welcome to today's webinar um, in which we'll be looking at uh, the latest round of product iterations for A-Frame, the cloud video collaboration platform. My name is Rory McVicker, I'm the head of product here at A-Frame and we've been working really, really hard based on a lot of customer feedback over the last six months to uh, deliver a better user experience in a number of key areas. So just to cover off a brief agenda for today's webinar, we're going to keep it relatively brief. Um, we're going to be, first of all, providing a little bit of background as to what A-Frame is and what it does for those of you who are new to the product. Um, we're going to be covering off some of the key use cases around how it's used in customer environments out in the wild. And then I'm going to be delivering a product demonstration of all of the key new features that we've rolled out in this product iteration. So for those of you who are new to A-Frame, um, fundamentally what A-Frame provides is a central place which provides visibility, access and clarity over your professional video projects. Whereas once video projects were siloed, they were too weighty to be, to, to be collaborated on uh, between geographies, we provide that central point through which collaboration can occur. Whether that be approvals, whether it be pre-edit, whether it be post-edit, whether it be distribution, it's all really around maximizing the value of content and making sure that the widest possible um, range within your organization can maximize the value of that content. Rather than it being locked away in a specific geography or a specific team or a specific use case, it's really about liberating that content that you spent, spent so much time on and making it more freely accessible to the widest possible group within your organization to maximize its value. So really it's not tied to a specific workflow. It's not tied to review and approval, although that's something that we do. It's not tied to logging, although that's something that we do also. It covers a whole range of different workflows. And really this is where we're talking about a platform, the cloud platform for video collaboration. The idea is that we lock into a central uh, storage and collaboration point all sets of different creative and collaborative tools which allow all of your users across all of your different groups, whether they're in uh, compliance, promotional teams, international reversioning, all of those different disparate groups within your organization, that central point and that central access to maximize the value of that content. We're very different from other cloud video providers and we have been from our inception in that we don't like to deal with proxy content. That doesn't maximize the value of your content. We'd actually rather take in the highest volume, most complex, most complex format, most broadcast ready content that you can throw us because it's through centrally uh, making that accessible that you maximize its value. So we can actually take in the broadest range of input formats on the market. And that's something that we uh, will talk about as we go through the call. Um, it's also something that defines who we are, really. It's, uh, it's a key tenant of what A-Frame is all about. That centralization of all of your working practices and collaboration also has a number of key benefits from a business intelligence uh, perspective. So you see those graphs there. That's a note to analytics. And the idea is that if you bring all of your teams together who used to work in their own environments, on their own infrastructure, with their own practices, you can for once uh, see uh, a, a more broad picture of your organization and begin to gain intelligence around how to maximize not just the value of content, but the value of the people that work for you and the value of their collaborative and creative endeavor through the uh, insight that you can gain from bringing them all together. And finally, the method of distribution and delivery for the product itself is a purely SaaS implementation. Uh, it's not pay up front in, in, in uh, CapEx on, on hardware. It's delivered via a browser. It, it's, it's billed as a service and it's delivered as a service, which means all of the product updates are delivered to you without needing to upgrade. Now, one of the key, key points, again, with A-Frame that we've been clear on from our very beginning is that the UI should be easy to use and friendly and, and actually loop people into that collaboration. It should be delivered in the browser. It should be... Um, training light and uh, a joy to use. And that's something that we've carried throughout, uh, moving away from some of the traditional kind of gray, monolithic, um, very kind of powerful and, and IT centric UIs into something that does a lot of very powerful things under the hood, but is actually um, managed and interacted with through a web application that, that people would be familiar with within a couple of days of using it. So what's different about A-Frame? I spoke a little bit about our key 
differentiator on being able to, to deal with high volumes and high complexity of, of media coming into the system. That's underpinned by our infrastructure. So the very at the very beginning of A-Frame, before we even developed the, uh, the front end at all, one of the key um, decisions that we made was to go with our own infrastructure. And here's a piece of anecdotal backstory to that. At the time, Amazon would only allow you to upload a five gig file maximum. Now, we knew that we needed to upload files greater than five gigs. So we took the decision at that time to build out our own infrastructure. Incidentally, since then, Amazon have, have lifted that restriction, but it was a key learning that we had at the very beginning. If we want control over the environment, if we want to pass that control over the environment to our customers, and fundamentally, if we want, to, if we want our customers to trust that we have the infrastructure to underpin the professional video workflow, then we need to build it from the ground up. It can't be a UI that sits on someone else's infrastructure. We need to be able to share the architectural diagrams and the disaster recovery and redundancy considerations we've made with people who have built these facilities themselves. People who are now transitioning to the cloud, but have you know rich careers and rich histories of building out systems in multi-region, uh, uh, multi-geography, disaster recovery, multi-redundancy, all of those things, we need to be able to speak to those customers and tell them that we understand how, what it takes to build a broadcast cloud. So we have nodes in London, Los Angeles, and New York. And whenever you upload to any one of those primary data centers, which by the way, are located in top tier colos, uh, ISO 27001 um, compliant, and all of those things that you require, we then um, take the uh, file that you've uploaded to us, copy it in its primary location and then a disaster and then run a disaster recovery copy across uh, the country. So you know and you have peace of mind that the security of your content is key to what A-Frame is doing here. There are three offsite copies. They're all 27,001 ISO compliant, factor credited over here in the UK, following the best practices outlined by the MPAA. And security is really, really important to us. We can go into that in greater detail as we go forward. But that's a key tenant again. SaaS, so I spoke about the ease of delivery. So no longer is it, a, um, for instance, a client waiting 10 hours to download a piece of video that's in a codec that is not supported by their machine. No, this is universalizing, if that is a word, in fact. This is making universally accessible a piece of video in all of its complex nature and simplifying it so that someone can log into a web browser and see that piece of video and begin collaborating around it. Of course, you have the key benefits of the cloud. So there's scalability. So today, if I know that I need a fixed capacity for today that's different for six months time, the traditional way I'd have to, to build this out and pay for it is I'd have to buy capacity for six months time. That just doesn't make sense. So A-Frame obviously hooks into that fundamental benefit of the cloud being a scalable infrastructure. Really, a lot of what we do is infrastructure as a service. Because of that infrastructure we've invested in and those data centers, you know that you can scale up and down in your operations and generate the business agilities you need in this fast paced world by adopting a cloud first kind of uh, methodology, which a lot of the larger companies have, have taken on board and, and moved towards. Finally, a real focus for us uh, over the last year and ongoing in terms of how we move forward is taking that concept of the platform and opening it out. So essentially what we want to do is make your content as freely accessible and interchangeable and interoperable with as many different systems as we possibly can. Right now that includes Adobe, Apple and Avid, but there are lots of different discussions in A-Frame HQ around how we take that uh, liberation of data and metadata and media and transpose it to different environments. Now, this is my bit. This is the product management bit. I was asked earlier this year to actually define our mission statement uh, in a sentence. And this is where we got to. And, and I think this is actually a pretty um, accurate indication of where our customers see value. So it's all about maximizing the value and the ongoing value at that of the content that we create by removing the obstacles that exist today in maximizing that value. So whether that is the duplicated system that the Italian region has when working with the Dutch region, whether that is the um, even the DVD that is in someone's hand that can't be seen by someone on the other side of the ocean, 
These are all in inefficiencies which lock in the value of media. They don't allow it to be maximized. And so what we do, because it's so hard to maximize that value, is that we move on to the next thing and we leave what we've done behind us and we don't maximize its value. So if you could make something centrally accessible, but not just centrally accessible as dumb storage, something that was centrally accessible as a previewable asset, something that was centrally accessible with collaboration tools built around it, and something that was centrally accessible with intelligent metadata def to define its flow within uh, your working environment, then you can really begin to generate business value from your content rather than just rushing to the next deadline and throwing all of the um, uh, value out of uh, out of the windows you move on to your next deadline so really that that moves into these um, kind of seven key tenants so I spoke about increasing revenue the idea that your international teams for example who need to reversion content could get to that content more quickly if it was centrally accessible could push it out through different channels to different consumer groups to generate more revenue, to generate more interest, to generate uh, more um, adoption of the brand. All of these things can be done once you centrally ex uh, um, store and, and make accessible your content. To make the full potential of that content so that it no longer goes to sleep once the deadline is hit. It's actually, in fact, still as valuable in a year's time as it was, to, as it was when it was created. And really, a lot of what that's about is taking the traditional idea of the archive and transposing it to something that's more contemporary, more dynamic, more valuable, something that isn't a, um, a dusty library, but is in fact a living, breathing archive that can be used just as easily by someone on one side of the world as it can be by someone on the other side of the world. We also save time and improve efficiencies um, both in the collaborative workflow of post-edit approvals, but also when something is captured on a camera and it needs to be moved, pushed to an edit, for example, you can hammer things into shape into A-Frame, leaving the raw quality inside A-Frame and then taking all of the metadata and media out into your edit environment. That can really save time. And, and it's just one example, in fact, of how we can save time with a, you know, a multi-geography distribution uh, system with intelligent metadata underpinning it. Security, scalability, and control of costs. Three really, really big and important tenants of the A-Frame cloud infrastructure and, and method of delivery. So security, I've spoken about that and we'll speak about some of the uh, brands that trust A-Frame later in the presentation. But it's at the core of every design decision we make in A-Frame Dev. So if we're building a new feature, the very first question on everyone's lips is, how are we going to make this fit with our security policy and everything that we do is centered around this this uh, picture that i've painted to you of building out our infrastructure having control over that infrastructure and then passing the control of that uh, infrastructure to the clients who use it to the media that they uh, need to secure scalability as we've spoken the the uh, the method of delivery in, in the infrastructure as a service allows you to uh, buy only what you need today and grow into uh, the cloud as, as a lot of our customers have done over the past year um, and to control costs. So we've done a lot of work actually within the business intelligence module of A-Frame to provide visibility for admins over which teams are using how much of the product, you know, which teams are using how much storage, which teams are transcoding, which teams are uh, sharing the most. All of these types of questions that in traditional, you know, piecemeal, buy a piece of software to fit a, um, cer a certain specified problem within a certain specified working group doesn't do. It doesn't give you that helicopter ability to uh, broaden your reach within a, uh, uh, a business intelligence and business framework kind of approach. And we've just actually uh, posted out a uh, customer survey to all of our customers. Um, and we got back some really interesting feedback. These are the top line statistics that we saw. So you can see here, great benefits are generated once you make that content centrally accessible. And these numbers do bear out to some extent the hypothesis that we had back in 2009 when the company was founded that people aren't maximizing the value of their content. So we see an increase in content usage here. We see an improvement in the security, the safety and the accessibility of that content. Um, we see improvements in efficiency and 
we also see a saving in cost. And that makes sense because if you traditionally had to cater to six infrastructures and you've now put, turned that into one infrastructure that's scalable and flexible, then it's not too much of a stretch to see how you can extrapolate that over time to, to increase those savings and to generate more and more value from the content that you've bothered to create fundamentally. So some of the organizations that currently use A-Frame and have been using A-Frame in some of these cases for a long, long time. Now we're very, very proud of the list of customers that we have. Um, in each one of these different, uh, behind each one of these different logos, there is always a personal story. There is always a dialogue that happens with us and these customers. A lot of the features that I'm going to show you today were, were requested and then iterated against through direct um, discussion with these customers. Um, there's also a broad range of different market verticals. And again, that goes back to the idea of a platform. If you have a platform, you can use it for one of a number of different purposes. And that's what these customers have done. Uh, we've worked with the teams within these customers to really analyze where the efficiencies can be driven and where the value can be generated. And then we've applied the technology to do that. And that's really a shift in um, how software is sold from the traditional model of a uh, purchase and then an upgrade. Now that we're running on a, a, a SaaS model in a lot of places in, in the software world, really software development is a dialogue. It's no longer delivery and then delivery in a, at a date in the future. We, we present to you today the A-Frame full release, but a lot of these customers have had the benefits of a lot of these features incrementally over time. And A-Frame is constantly evolving and constantly changing. And probably the largest part of that is the feedback we get from our customers. And I thank them very much for it because I think we have a much better product for their insight. So moving on to today's uh, main agenda, the demonstration and also some of the key features we're launching. So we have actually two um, development release cycles or two milestone release cycles over the course of a year. One runs uh, between November and April, and that's what we call the A-Frame Spring Release. And that actually runs up until NAB. And one runs uh, in the other six month interval of the year from May uh, through to October. And uh, what, we, what we do is we um, upvote essentially the aspects of the platform within that milestone that customers have responded to the most. So whereas the spring release is largely attributable to innovation, to pushing the boundaries of the product further, we actually uh, designate a whole milestone to that discussion with customers to understanding now that we've innovated, what do we need to improve? What do we need to uh, make work better for people? What do we need to refine? What do we need to enhance? And that's really important because we don't want to get into a position where we're only listening to our own uh, um, beliefs and we take the customer out of the picture. This is a whole milestone with the purpose of making A-Frame a joy to use and genuinely useful for our customers. So with that being said, some of the uh, features that we've announced based on direct customer uh, feedback, we've broadened and simplified at the same time the range of uh, methods that you can get content into and out of A-Frame. So a key part of that has been uh, through the delivery of an HTML5 um, browser uh, transfer agent which I'll show you in just a moment. We've broadened and improved the um, administrative control that the people who are um, providing this service to their internal teams have over their internal teams so that they can see and understand what's going on and more importantly, lock it down, lock down that product to only what they want to happen within it. So a lot of work's gone into that. We've put in a lot of refinements and enhancements to the UI and to how you fundamentally interact with your media, how you move it about, how you categorize it, how you push it into your different categories and all of these different um, pieces of feedback that we got from the real media managers who are often driving the utilization of the service within their teams. We've expanded our file format support so that dailies from the back of uh, a, a DIT's Magic DaVinci Resolve uh, machine uh, can now be processed or Avid OP Atom uh, now can also be previewed and uh, interacted with and collaborated on in the browser. Spanned clips um, from Canon and Panasonic P2 cameras is, are now represented as a continuous take with continuous time code. 
Um, so a lot of work's gone into file format support and not just that, but also some of the things that you can't see, some of the refinements and enhancements around what is this piece of media? Now, the, the, the metadata that we extract at source now is that much greater. And I'll show you some of that as we move through the demo. We've also, I believe we are the only people to uh, be doing this currently. We've, we've implemented audio track selection in the player. So we're trying to make video in the player in A-Frame as local and as like an NLE as we possibly can. People are used to interacting with uh, tracks of audio. It's totally understandable. But uh, until recent advancements with HTML5 technology, it wasn't really possible. I mean, if you go to YouTube or Vimeo's um, support um, sites, you'll see requests for multi-audio multi uh, track selection that have not yet been met. And we've we've been working so much with international teams who made it so clear to us that this was a real important factor for their teams to be able to collaborate globally uh, with one canonical original that we've uh, prioritized that and, and worked, worked specifically on it and released it in this milestone. And then there are a whole host of UI um, enhancements that we've made over the uh, last six months. So I'll now switch to uh, Safari so that I begin showing you some of those things and some of, some of the ways that they're working out. So this is the A-Frame UI, and to the naked eye, you may uh, wonder what has changed, but as you begin to use it, as a user would, in their kind of eight-hour working shift of managing media, you'll notice that so many incremental changes have been added. So for a start, I can see that now all of my documents are merged into one consolidated media panel. We released this in beta at, uh, at NAB, but we've built on it to now generate audio waveforms to present uh, um, previews for still images and to um, consolidate all of the different kind of pieces of media that go into a typical project. So you can see here we've got our infrastructure there, which I could collaborate and share with another viewer and we could talk about that. I've also got a Premiere Pro project there that I could send out as part of a package in a share link, which I'll show you in just a moment. And I've got a whole zipped up um, asset there, which contains all of my GFX, all of my uh, audio renders, everything that I need to go into a project. So I could essentially build a collection and put all of these different assets into it and share that out as a package with my international team. So in fact, I'm gonna do that now just to show you how some of the different, uh, some of the different uh, aspects of the UI have changed here. So I'm gonna select that zip file and the project. I'm gonna select the logo it references, the audio file, some of these clips. Let me just make sure that's the right clip. Up it pops in an HTML5 player. Oh, you can see there that there's a new track selector. So I can see that I, in fact, wanted to play this with both audio channels there instead of just the mix down. Okay, that's good, let's select that as well. And now let's put all of these assets into a new collection. So I'm gonna call this collection Shared Package V2, and I'll explain V2 in just a minute. When I save those changes, you can see now that in my collection dropdown, as I type into it, there's a Shared Package V2. And that contains only the assets that have been added to that collection. By the way, if I wanted to switch this to list view so that I could see more about these assets, so what are their titles, what are their file sizes, uh, what is, what's their duration of their video, that's also possible now. And now I could take this package, I could add to it if I wanted using just the same process that we looked at before, but I can also share it. So let's say shared package for LATAM. Let's allow the uh, recipient to download the original if they want, and let's apply a uh, expiry of tomorrow. Now I've got a number of different options. So I could actually request approval for these assets. I could email them either as an unguessable link or requiring the recipient to log in to specific email addresses, or I could just create the link. If I create that link now and move into a new browser here, you'll see what the recipient would receive, a link to just the content they required in a simple, previewable, universally accessible in IE, Firefox, Safari, even Opera, all of, the, all of the usuals, that ability to preview and work with that content, which is a mile away from that concept of downloading for eight hours and then finding out that it's in an uncompliant codec. I can also, as the sender, 
track a lot of these uh, links that are being sent out to the different users. So you can see earlier on, I sent out a link for approval, funnily enough, to myself. I was having a split personality moment, and that was approved. So if I move back to my media panel, and I now filter all of my project to just the approved assets, I can see there's just one that's been approved. And let's see if that's in any collections. Ah, oh, it's in finals. Well, that makes perfect sense because it's uh, good to go, as the um, approval uh, comment um, told me. You'll see also that the filters here on the right hand side have been given a new lick of paint and are now fully uh, expandable and disclosable so that you can again, again, this is based on those media managers who, who spend a lot of time looking at this UI and have got so much insight to offer into how it would work better for them. We can also filter by keyword. So let me just write in forehand here. This is a project on tennis, so I'd expect some uh, clips that match that keyword. So there's the clip of Rafa Nadal winning the US Open. If I click on great forehand, there's Rafa hitting a great forehand. And in fact, there he is winning the US Open. So let's move to the exact point, frame by frame, that Rafa jumps in the air. And let me put in winning the tournament. That's now a piece of metadata that the rest of my team could search, they could respond to, they could export into the edit, or they could work with in a number of different ways. And that's a new, uh, that, that's a concept we've taken even further in commenting actually now, as we've built in um, real-time collaboration with app mentions. So if I wanted my colleague Will Pitt to know about this particular frame, in fact, this isn't the exact frame that I want Will to know about. We all know in video frames are really important so actually, let's move forward a few seconds. And now let's write in Rafa head in hands. Now my colleague Will is going to get an email to that exact time code point. When he clicks on the link in that email, he'll be delivered to that point in the video and he could respond. And so you could see how you could build up a uh, either an approval workflow or even a pre-edit uh, dailies workflow, which uh, filters into a uh, multi-geography, multi-office collaboration process that really wasn't possible before when we used to have emails and DVDs and burns in time codes and all the layers of indirection that existed between the people making the video and the video itself. This is totally direct. I'm commenting on a frame and Will is going to get a pointer to that exact frame. I'm also going to show you now some of the intelligence we've added around upload and, and bring in as well some of the uh, hooks that we've put into Adobe Premiere and Adobe Prelude. So let me click on upload media here. Let me change my mode and you'll see now that there are a range of new options. So upload is honestly one of the hardest things to get right for any cloud provider and any cloud provider who, who tells you otherwise is lying. It is a hard problem to solve, and that's why we allocate a lot of people to it here. It's a, it's a fair chunk of the, of the time that the team spend is on making upload better. Now, over the past year or so, a lot of uh, new types of users have been uh, joining uh, and signing up to A-Frame. And, and those types of users maybe aren't uploading whole, card, whole camera card structures, which is what we have typically seen in the past. Maybe they're uploading a export from an edit. And what those users need is different from the person who's uploading a 64 gig card. It's fundamentally different and it requires different technologies. So we have, in addition to our desktop app, built a much simpler, much more uh, kind of um, install light and uh, kind of easier to get up and running um, upload tool, which uses HTML5 for the casual, for the casual uploader. So here we've got on my desktop here, we've got A-Frame Promo Final. So this is the video that you'll all have seen with, with our CEO walking through the streets of Soho. I'm going to drop that onto the upload window. And you can see now that's really fast. Um, the way that works actually is by cutting up the file into chunks and parallelizing the upload so that we have three chunks in parallel being sent to the server. That's really fast, but it also means that we can, for instance, pause a transfer and resume with it. We can, in the event of a browser failure, um, reopen our browser and carry on from where we left off. Um, and it also allows us to provide a user experience for that 
for that executive um, promo producer who just needs to upload uh, a single file a much better user experience because it's so light touch, it's so easy, and it's so communicative. So I want to follow now the ingest and transcode processing for that particular job. So you can see the file has landed in into the uh, project. You can see that we've detected the clip from that file, and now we are transcoding an H.264. I could see more granular detail around all of that if I wanted to expand this view. And that, that goes for all of the jobs that have been uploaded into this project over the course of the last few days. Now, if I move to media, there's our clip that we've just uploaded. Now, let's open it in the player. Now, really interestingly, um, one of the uh, things you'll probably notice here is all of these markers are already applied against the video. How did that happen, you ask? It's all down to a uh, very tight integration with Adobe's XMP toolkit. So earlier on, I opened this file within uh, Premiere. I gave it a description. I gave it some keywords. Um, I gave it a copyright status. And I applied all of these time code markers. And now the rest of the team looking at this clip can jump to the exact points in the video. Even my colleague Alistair's screen debut there. Didn't he do well? So that's the HTML5 uploader covered off, but that's not to say that we haven't been working on the desktop app. So the desktop app caters for a very different type of use case. It's a um, uh, it's targeted specifically at the power users who are uploading um, you know, hundreds of gigabytes worth of data running asynchronously over time in the background. So we've made a number of different and a number of new enhancements to this. Uh, we launched the download capability as well at, at uh, NAB. We've introduced settings so we can actually accelerate um, using embedded file catalyst technology uh, within this product. Any of your transfers which are happening over wide geographic regions on high latency, uh, high speed networks. So we've got UDPS built in. So it's effectively the same as any of the kind of transfer acceleration technologies that you've built in. That requires a little bit of setup, of course, with uh, with your server and with your firewall uh, out of out of necessity. So what we've also done is built in uh, the uh, user um, settings to define which protocols you're using. So if you want to use FTPS, you can use FTPS or HTTPS, in fact. You can leave it at auto if you want your network to detect and use the best uh, method for you. Um, incidentally, those S's, the reason why it's not UDP or FTP, all of these transfers are encrypted in transit at AES128 um, uh, uh, bit encryption, so that you know that once all of your data has left your machine, it's completely impregnable up until the point when it reaches A-frame servers, which is, as we've spoken about before, our infrastructure, our closed cloud, and then will be uh, stored in duplicate on that primary server, and then will be duplicated to a disaster recovery site hundreds at all thousands of miles away. In, in London, it will run from uh, the south of London to the north of London, and in the US, it will run between uh, New York and Los Angeles dynamically. So we run an active, active, but also disaster recovery um, backup. Again, over 10 gigabit dark fiber leased lines owned, maintained by us, uh, terminating at networking equipment owned and maintained by us. So it's a really locked in environment. And again, to any of our customers, uh, we're happy to share details on that environment. We're happy to be uh, submitted to uh, penetration tests and all of the different things people who build clouds have to go through um, and, and that facilities have had to go through for years and um, anyone building out a broadcast infrastructure has had to uh, pay special attention to. Let me move back into the application now and take, uh, take you through some of the new administrative controls that we've added into the platform. So around this time last year, we, we launched actual um, business intelligence metrics and analytics for um, account-wide usage statistics. So you can see here, I've got a graph which grows over time, and that's the, again, that's 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 the wonder of the cloud environment. Now that I'm at 100%, I could call up my account manager, we could arrange something, and tomorrow I could be at 10%, for example. There's no fixed capacity. We can keep on scaling as we go. But I can also see 
for instance, in this um, in this UI, who's using what? So which projects are actually occupying the most storage? So you can see that project there is occupying a lot of storage, and we can we can go through and and um, kind of gain intelligence around where some of the uh, assets are generating the most value. Um, we can also see who's using the, the product across the account, and we can remove that person if we wanted to with a click of a button. They're now no longer on any of those teams. We could then see all of the uploads that are coming into the system and track them back again to a specific project, all of the downloads and all of the sharing. Now, sharing is a really interesting um, metric uh, that we found over the past years, particularly with commercial groups and distribution teams who are maybe using A-Frame to replace their screeners um, that they've had in, in a variety of different solutions in the past. For example, if, if you're going to a trade, if your commercial team is going, going to a trade show, you can see how effective their shared content is because you can switch from your links sent out to your views and you can see the factor increase on what people are looking at. You can again attribute that to a specific project so you can really hone in on where the value is. And that's that's something that's been in the product for a little bit of time, but we've taken what was um, at this time last year, quite a limited set of options, uh, just metrics really at that point, And we've expanded it to include organizations. So here I can actually designate of the amount of storage and seats that I have bought from A-Frame as the central uh, administrative or information technology team, I can choose that my UK team gets two terabytes and 20 users. I can choose that my US team gets two terabytes and 25 users. And I can tot up between what's going on and I can then manage that. I can add it administrators, so they build projects and add content and manage the user permissions within a project. Um, and I can um, scale up and scale down a team storage. So if I was over billing one, one team, and remember this all transfers back to billing, if I was charging this out as a cost model, I now have the information to know where the value resides within the organization. And I can speak to those groups and I can understand better about what they're trying to do with the content that we're trying to maximize. Transcode, so A-Frame has a, um, a, a large range of broadcast transcodes that we can transcode to. This actually came out of a collaboration with our uh, customers, Fox Sports One in the States, um, who were looking for a solution which was to take a, vi a wide variety of incoming media and have a kind of interstitial transcode processing bay in the cloud where all of their iPhone content, all of their stringer content from people shooting on AVC HD or P2 or whatever it may be, and turn it into a format that was compliant with their um, Quantel system. So along those lines, we could take any content coming in and we could make available to our teams, to our um, uh, organizations within the account, different transcode options. And we can refine and really refine to a very granular detail all of the abilities that are available to these users in our, in our group, those people we saw on the team page. So if I wanted to switch off uh, accessing activity for the whole account, all I need to do is click disabled, save my changes, and no one will be able to access that page. Users can access the main media page. When we released this, actually, we, we spoke a little bit about it, and it was a really interesting use case that one of our customers gave me from a um, security perspective. The ability to switch off globally access to a media page with the click of a button is so, so powerful for someone who is security conscious. Because you know with that one click of the button, at the very top of this hier hierarchy that you've established with an A-frame, no one can break that. They, if they try and access that page within any of the projects under this umbrella, they won't be able to do it. So you can have peace of mind until you've um, changed the situation that you've locked off access from everyone. And moving further down the list, if you wanted certain feet, if certain features weren't um, really useful within an organizational uh, use case, you could turn them off so that you didn't have any questions about what does that button do. What we're doing though, again, with that platform idea is we're giving you all of the building blocks to administer the, the service yourself. We're not being prescriptive in how you use the service and we're not being, um, we're not trying to build a product where everyone uses every single feature. We're quite happy for certain groups to see value in some parts of the product and other groups work with other parts of the product. So this is really about extending that platform idea to the people who administrate it, those central uh, business groups and, and IT groups who uh, are, are looking at the cloud, are liking the idea of the cloud, 
but are also really conscious that they don't want to be giving up control when they move something to the cloud. It's still your content. You should still have complete control over it. Now, all of these um, settings that you can see are applied through a really um, well-defined multi-tier hierarchy. So here, I'm looking at the account, but I'm also an account, uh, I'm also an organization administrator for the uh, UK team. So I've only enabled for the UK team specifically certain transcodes, the, uh, the PAL transcodes, as you may expect. The uh, US team have the NTSC transcodes enabled. In my UK team, perhaps I don't want anyone to be able to share uh, clips. And I could switch that off, and immediately that, that feature would be no longer available to any of the users within this organization. But it doesn't even um, end there. Going right down back into the project where we started at the foot of this tree, in my settings page, I can choose who's got access to the project and which level of access they should have, whether it's admin access, project, workspace, logging. But I can also tune just to this specific project, which may just have a few people working within it out of thousands of people across the account, certain features uh, to be enabled or disabled. So really, really granular controls headed up at the account admin level, passed through the organizational admin level, and then passed through to the um, project admin, who has, uh, again, the same, um, the same uh, level of controls uh, only defined by what the uh, people above them in the hierarchy have given. So they can only see a list that has been presented them by the people above them in that hierarchy. So something that's traditionally really, really hard, user permissions and, and, and hierarchies, we've tried to simplify as much as possible, but retain all of that um, business complexity uh, for the user to be able to apply. Just going back to how uh, users are invited and how they work with content, I could lock someone to a specific collection. So that package that I created earlier, I could add my colleague Simon to only see that package and none of the other access, none of the other points of access in the project, none of the other clips. I could then choose that I didn't want him to be able to change the media title or add comments, but I did want him to be able to export metadata because he's an editor taking things out. So again, very, 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 very simple building blocks based around the idea of um, scope and then abilities. And as we look through the rest of the product, as we're moving um, now towards the end of the demonstration, I just want to make note as well while we're on this page, a third option. We have the desktop app for um, automated transfers via watch folders for large volume, uh, large, large volumes of transfers. We have the HTML5 uploader for the simple, more complex, more light touch user experience uploads. And then we also have the FTP uploader. So if I've got someone who's perhaps an external supplier, I give them a set of FTP credentials. They're entirely locked to their own FTP incoming directory. They can't see anyone else's content. They can see nothing in the project. They can't log into A-Frame, in fact. But using CyberDuck or FileZilla or whatever it is they use, they can contribute to me. That's another way of getting media in. So now if I look back through the, the uh, product, we've gone through pretty much all of the different tabs that we wanted to take a look at. We can see the activity of all of this content. We can see that my colleague, Will, here has mentioned that he loves this shot too. So let's open that clip in the browser and let's see that collaboration coming to fruition with Will's comment being passed back to me here as a direct reference to that self-same frame 01001803. So moving back now to the PowerPoint, there's nothing else really to, to cover off at this stage. But I did want to say, obviously, thank you very much for the great attendance we've had today and uh, for, for joining us for this webinar and for your interest in A-Frame. And also open out to the floor any questions that you guys have got based on what you've seen today. And I, I'm, I'm joined by Simon, my colleague here. Simon, do we have any questions from, um, from, from the viewers? We the do, we do. We have a <clears throat> couple of questions about security sure. um, from uh, Jenna Cordell. Um, you say my data is stored in the private DC yet all customers share the same DC. So what, in what ways is your private DC better than Amazon? That's a great, that's a great question, Al. I think some of the comparison points between us and Amazon, in fact, I've just got a nod actually from one of my other colleagues that some of that question may not have been heard. So I'm, I'm just gonna go over Al's, Al's point there. He asks, 
uh, based on, on security, uh, we mentioned that we, we uh, operate our own infrastructure, but obviously more than one customer uses that infrastructure. So how do we take that multi-tenant scenario and make it more secure than, say, Amazon? And this is where I'd say I'm not going to play against Amazon in the answer to this question. I think it's a, a, a really well architected you know, behemoth of cloud uh, security that obviously is used by a range of different customers. But where we do win against Amazon is we are tuned exclusively to broadcast. So all of the decisions we have ever made in the design and um, um, implementation of our infrastructure has all been with a broadcast user at the forefront of our minds, not medical, financial, legal, all of those other kind of things to consider. Now, you may say, well, it's all object uh, storage, isn't it? It should all just be the same. I would disagree with that based on the experiences that we've had when we've spoken to people who have built out their own facilities o over time. Some of some of the customers on that list, when we've we've discussed our architecture and, and some of the um, considerations we've put into it, it's really important that we can talk the talk as far as it goes with uh, building out the infrastructure that we use. Specific to the question on multi-tenancy uh, within A-Frame, so again, it is all, ob all object storage. Everything is obfuscated at the file level. Everything is uh, encrypted uh, in terms of access um, um, to, to the servers. It is housed within top tier data, uh, data centers uh, in those three cities that I mentioned. Um, and, then also, and then essentially it's the, it, it's the software and the, um, the uh, baked in route for that asset that starts at the point of ingest as soon as the file hits the server. In fact, before that, as soon as the upload is started and the AS encryption is applied, as soon as it lands, it's landing into a funnel and that funnel is your account. The people who can access that content can only access it through the um, allocation of certain privileges that have been defined by the administrator. And that runs through that hierarchy. So going back to that idea that today, if I wanted nobody in A-Frame to be able to see the media page until I cleared up a security breach, I as the admin would click on that um, toggle and I would effectively disable access for, the, for my extended team um, un until I re-enabled it, no one would be able to access it. So um, it's a mix of obfuscation and um, intelligent um, software approaches to uh, rights restrictions really is how we've tackled it. But the, the, contra the compare and contrast with Amazon, I wouldn't I wouldn't um, I wouldn't pit us against Amazon uh, specifically within security. It's actually much more around the users that we're trying to cater for and the use cases that we're trying to cater for. OK, uh, another question on security, um, which you can answer briefly. And then we've got a few other questions coming in. Um, yeah. So are your security staff as competent and 24 seven ready as other large cloud providers? Yes, so uh, when, when we look at the infrastructure, it is housed within those top tier data centers. So they are ISO compliant, ISO 27001 compliant. We have a uh, core infrastructure team who have designed the system, who have built out the system, who scale it, who maintain it, who know absolutely everything about the system that there is to know. So from the physical access to the servers, you're covered by the uh, top tier data centers. From the expertise in how to tune that environment, how to extend it, how to scale it, and how to secure it, you have the benefit of a team that has now spent five years doing this. Now, remember, a lot of people five years ago probably thought A-Frame was crazy by saying, put your high resolution, high volume, high complexity media into the cloud. We've uh, put a lot of effort into understanding all of the uh, considerations around security in those five years. They're five long years in terms of understanding all of the complexities around the, the infrastructure pitch that we are taking to market. And we've learned a lot from that. And I believe it gives us a certain level of expertise um, that perhaps some of our competitors don't have if they are relying wholesale on a bought in infrastructure that they build a product on top of, for example. OK, uh, moving on from security, um, there was a question about Adobe Anywhere and how far is the integration uh, reached and is the feature available as part of the product? It's a great question. It was actually something I intended to cover off as part of my opening agenda. So I, I apologize for that. To, who, who's, who's the? It's Michael. Sorry, for, sorry for, for omitting this from the beginning of the, uh, of the presentation, Michael. Today is all about uh, the fall 2015 product release and all of the different kind of in, uh, enhancements we've made to the product uh, itself, A-Frame, the web app, and A-Frame, the desktop app. 
Now we continue to work on the integration with Adobe Anywhere. So that's Adobe Anywhere and the cloud delivered by A-Frame. That was something we took to NAB this year as a proof of concept. We showed um, Bruce, our, our, uh, my colleague, um, creating a, an edit from high resolution ProRes 422 files stored on our New York server over a 15 megabit um, um, uh, Wi-Fi connection in a very busy um, Las Vegas convention center and created a cut and then exported that and pushed it back to A-Frame. That is currently in a closed beta. So we have made advancements. Uh, we're working with uh, a couple of really large broadcasters on um, basically building out and scaling that product. And there will be announcements on that product in uh, the early part of 2016. So uh, currently today, I would say that um, we're working towards productizing what we showed you at NAB. I really appreciate the uh, interest. And if you'd like to send me an email offline, um, let's discuss how, how the service is going and, and how you see A-Frame fitting in over time. Simon has given me the nod that that's all of the questions. So just uh, all that's left to say again is thank you so much for all of your attention this afternoon or, or morning, depending on where you are. And uh, I really appreciate your time and hope to see you soon. If you have any questions, you can email us at hireaframe.com or my, uh, my own email address is roryataframe.com. I would really welcome any questions that you guys have got or based on what you've seen in the product today, places where you think we could add value. I'm always up for hearing those, uh, for receiving those emails. They're, they're good ones to get in my inbox. So thanks again for, for joining us and see you soon.